Hello. This video explains how free floating in immunohistochemistry is done when we are trying to do multiple rounds of tyramide signal amplification. And for those who are not 100% clear on what all that means, I'll explain in the following sort of background segment. Uh, this background segment is a bit lengthy, and if you're just looking for the actual hands-on real-world procedure, you can skip ahead to the timestamp below. Additionally, uh, the hands-on procedure I will be following along with my protocol, which if you'd like uh, a copy of, you can get me at this email address displayed here. Now, a quick preface on what IHC is when we're trying to do it to tissue specimens, particularly brain tissue sections. So generally, one thing that I do, and a lot of other people that work in neuroscience do, is that we use immunohistochemistry in order to highlight particular markers of interest on brain tissue sections. This is something that people call tissue slices, for instance. So. Uh, those markers might have something to do with like dopamine receptors in the brain uh, or other random proteins that we might want to tag to see where in the brain they are. In particular, I and other labs uh, are interested in trying to find where in the brain these markers are. So what specific brain regions like the nucleus accumbens or the frontal cortex or the occipital lobe or whatever else have you. Uh, in particular, some of those labs might not be as interested in knowing exactly where within a cell those markers are. So I'm not really concerned with things on the cellular level. I'm still concerned with things on the uh, whole brain and subregions kind of level. So getting that extra detailed information by looking all the way zoomed in on specific cells, not something I really need at the current moment to try to figure out the answers to questions that I have. Now, when we're trying to look at like that subcellular really zoomed in type of perspective, that would be using high magnification on a microscope. And that high magnification comes with a very narrow field of view and also a narrow depth of field. Instead, I wanna to try to get as much visible at the same time within my window on the microscope, within the eyepieces or in the camera's view. And I wanna capture it all at once. Now, I'll explain in a little bit the terms uh, field of view and depth of field. So, a little bit of the beginning bit and some examples here of what I mean by trying to look at brain tissue in these ways. If we are using lower magnification, we do get a bigger field of view and bigger depth of field. So let's say that we have a rat brain section. This is a diagram where these dotted lines and solid lines represent divisions of the brain. So uh, over here we have nucleus accumbens uh, with its respective subregions, lateral septum will be up here. This gray area would be a ventricle, a fluid filled pocket in the brain, and various other areas are drawn in here. And let's say that we have a microscope with its low magnification setup hovering over here. So if I had a uh, stained brain section and I was uh, hovering over this spot, a picture might look something like this. And so if you're not 100% clear, because maybe you don't spend much time with these sections, that's totally fine. I'll point out some things that can help me figure out where I am. For instance, this uh, weird oval dot here in the diagram corresponds to the anterior commissure, this sort of gray blob here where I put AC. The lateral septum up here corresponds with this grayish area up here. The lateral ventricle is this sort of black wedge shape. It almost looks like a tear in the tissue, but isn't. It's the very bottom tip of the lateral ventricle that is caught within our field of view. Uh, we also have a little bit of a curve here, this sort of uh, very hazy curve as part of the pyriform cortex. So basically, I can actually see landmarks that tell me where I'm looking at in this brain section. And I can use these landmarks in order to figure out boundaries of the brain range of interest, let's say the nucleus accumbens, both of its subregions. So I would draw a shape that's kind of like this. It's not perfect but at least I have a good idea of encompassing the nucleus accumbens as far as its full extent in one picture. 
I don't need to have a bunch of tiny pictures that are zoomed in in order to stitch this together. Uh, so doing things at low magnification when we're trying to look at whole brain regions is not too difficult. Let's contrast that with uh, when we try to zoom things in. Now, to kind of explain the idea of depth of field, let me just take a quick tick back here. Uh, all this uh, example, this low magnification allows for a bigger field of view. We basically have a, a wider viewpoint of the whole section. We don't see the entire section, but this box is uh, a large chunk of this section. We can have a lot of the section within view rather than a teeny, teeny, tiny box that only has, let's say, maybe only the anterior cometer in, field, in, in view. So the lower magnifications allow for a bigger field of view which is important for just trying to get uh, a fewer large pictures in order to see a more holistic perspective. Now, there is the other aspect called depth of field. Uh, if you have a lower magnification objective on your microscope, it will have a thicker depth of field. This is basically how much stuff is within your view, within focus in your view, uh, and basically how far that extends. So for the average piece of tissue, like brain tissue, uh, if we're using a 4X objective <clears throat> multiplied by 10, given the microscope setup, they'll probably put it at roughly total 40X magnification. Uh, so a 4X objective will usually have a depth of field of about 40 micrometers. And so that means that as long as we center our focus plane, uh, our up and down focus, in the middle of this range, then everything above and below that's within a 40 micrometer range will appear in focus. Nothing will appear blurry, in other words. Things that are outside of that, like the upper five uh, micrometers outside this range here, lower five micrometers outside that range on the bottom, those might become a little bit blurry. And farther out you go, the blurrier it gets. So, Having a low magnification allows for a good depth of field. This is important because if we did high magnification, like shown here on the right, we would have a much thinner depth of field. Now, this is meant for really zooming in on single cells and trying to get uh, much more detail on those singular cells. However, the depth of field is extremely constrained in contrast. So just by going up to a 10x objective, not a huge jump, this will usually curtail the depth of field between 5 and 10 micrometers, where that 5 and 10 micrometers within this range is in focus, but then everything outside that range gets increasingly more and more blurry as you go further away. So the tissue that I use typically is 40 to 50 micrometers thick. And we'll see a little bit of a reason why later. But using that thick tissue, I want to have a lot of stuff in view without it being blurry. So this is another thing that having a lower magnification objective, like here on the left, allows for. That allows for a greater depth of uh, field without having a bunch of stuff in the tissue be blurry. So knowing a little bit more about depth of field, Let's take a look at what happens when we try to view that same brain section with a much more magnified viewpoint. Let's say it's a 10x objective. So it can lead to better detail, that's for sure. But depending on what your research question is, that detail may not necessarily be necessary. So certainly the field of view is going to be more constrained. We'll have a picture like this. And the problem is that looking at this picture out of context, we don't know where it is. Even if we label this picture, oh, this is the nucleus accumbens, we don't really have many details telling us like how far forward or back in the nucleus accumbens this section comes from, where exactly it is, whether it's the core or the shell subregions, a lot of other things. Basically, we don't have clear landmarks within view. The best we have is maybe this thing over here is the anterior commissure, possibly we're not 100% sure because it's cropped off from view. We have a constrained field of view because we're zoomed in too far. The other factor is that having a higher magnification objective will make things out of focus. So instead of having this picture where we could relatively clearly see all these little dots that represent the stained cells, uh, 
a zoomed in picture might have the individual cells be brighter, but then there'll be a bunch of them that are out of focus and it just generally doesn't look great. Kind of like this example here, if we just brighten the individual cells. So um, you can kind of see why for my purposes, and hopefully uh, it will be useful for you if you're trying to do brain mapping type stuff, why I go for lower magnification objectives. There is a caveat though. If you're trying to view things at low magnification, the stains will probably be very dim, if not outright invisible. Part of the problem is that having the objective further away means that more light disperses away from the section, less light goes into the objective, and thus things appear dimmer. And this is the trade-off between going at lower magnification versus higher magnification. So this picture has actually been artificially brightened. This is basically what we were working with a few slides ago that I started drawing all the little landmarks on, anterior commissure, lateral septum, lateral ventricle, pyriform cortex, and then I outlined the nucleus accumbens roughly in yellow. The problem is that, again, I edited this in post in order to make it brighter looking uh, for this slide presentation. The actual brightness might be something more like this, or might be even dimmer than this, especially if you're not using an amplified staining mechanism or editing it in post or other things. So uh, unfortunately at low magnification, it makes stains a lot dimmer or harder to see. Now, how to resolve this? There are a few methods. One thing as I did here, was that you could just amplify the image's brightness afterwards. You could mess around with the contrast and things like that. You could even balance the cover color curves in programs like ImageJ, Photoshop, GIMP, whatever else. The problem is that if the image is really, really, really dim and there isn't much difference between the stain and the background tissue, autofluorescence and garbage, whatever going on visually, there's gonna be increased likelihood that any alterations you make to the image will cause some artifacts to pop up. And the problem with that is that when you have more artifacts, it'll be harder to tell what is the stain that you applied, what is specifically stained and what is non-specific random background garbage. One other approach that you could try is instead, or maybe in conjunction, trying to increase the camera sensitivity when you're first acquiring the images on the microscope. Now, this does work to some degree, but some cons include that the camera might have limits to how high you could go with this. It might not be able to set the gain any higher. It might not be able to set the offset any lower. Uh, the exposure times, because you can change the exposure in order to get more and more light accumulating before the image is finished, uh, it can cause the exposure times to get a little silly. So in order to make a dim image brighter, you could make the exposure like three to five seconds, but these cameras are mostly working on the span of uh, at most hundreds of milliseconds for much more zoomed in images. So trying to work also with a live feed that only updates every few seconds, you can imagine it's really obnoxious when you're trying to move around the slide and you can't really figure out what you're moving to because you only see a snapshot every three to five seconds. That seems annoying. Another aspect is that there are some cameras, not, not all cameras, but some cameras uh, might be damaged. If their sensitivity is set really high, maybe by the prior user trying to amplify a really dim stain, and then somebody new gets in on the microscope, uh, zooms it in all the way at 40x, has a really bright stain, and then has a setting still tweaked really high, uh, those camera settings might cause the camera to have damage where its sensitivity gets worn down, uh, basically uh, usage wear and tear. So let's talk about the approach I use. I prefer to amplify the actual stains long before the images are even acquired. And so even though the staining process is certainly more complicated than the average stain, I think that the payoff is pretty great considering some of the other aspects that we could do. So to understand how the staining amplification works, I want to talk first about how traditionally 
fluorescence immunohesc chemistry is done, or immunofluorescence for short. So usually in the past, it had been done with this label, labeled secondary antibody method. The way that that works is we'll have some sort of target in a cell, in a bunch of cells. Uh, the target that I'm looking at, for example, is this protein called Delta Phos B. So we'll say it's this red sort of uh, uh, tipped over Pac-Man shape here. So that's Delta Phos B. So the, tar the target's in the tissue. Now, when you're staining the tissue with an antibody, the primary antibody will tag that target because the primary antibody was created to only tag Delta Phos B or DFB for short. Uh, of course, the primary antibody doesn't have any label on it, so it can't really be seen yet. So this uh, rabbit anti-Delta Phos B antibody created from rabbit blood will target the protein, our target of interest, Delta Phos B. The follow-up method, the follow-up step is where we use a secondary antibody to target the primary antibody. In other words, in donkey, we infuse rabbit antibodies so that the donkey creates anti-rabbit antibodies. Basically, the donkey is creating antibodies against what it senses as a foreign protein in its blood, uh, and so it will have antibodies against the rabbit antibodies. And so those are represented by these purple things coming in here. Now, the secondary antibodies aren't just blank. The secondary antibodies actually come with their own fluorescing labels. So when you shine a certain type of light on them, they'll fluoresce back out green, for example. And those are indicated with these green stars here. Now, the problem is that the vast majority of stains using this methodology will only start to be visible at 10x objectives or even higher, like 20 or 40x. And that kind of sucks. Because again, you have a constrained field of view and you have a bunch of stuff out of focus above and below your plane of focus. In other words, bad depth of field as well. Okay, so let's say we wanna amplify the stain. There are various methods to do this. One of the popular methods is this other one called uh, labeled streptavin biotin uh, amplification process, LSAB for short, if you will. And that's one way that you could find it on the web. This just has a third step of attaching some stuff to the target. So we'll start off where we have a target that exists in your biological sample, DFB for short. That's one over here. The primary antibody will tag this target is again, rabbit anti-DFB antibody, two over here. The secondary antibody will hunt down and tag the primary antibody as before, three donkey anti-rabbit tagging the rabbit antibody. Four, on the secondary antibody, it doesn't have visible labels. Instead, it's peppered with biotin, a certain type of small protein substance. And so that's not visible yet, but it is uh, labeling all over these secondary antibodies, these green stalks here. And so it happens that there's a reaction in nature between these chemicals streptavidin and biotin, where streptavidin will very specifically latch on to biotin. So then we have streptavidin in the solution and it targets the biotin. This streptavidin is not just blank though, this streptavidin has already uh, coming along with it fluorescent tags. In other words, these red ball type things here. So in this way, we've amplified our signal much more compared to the last slide where we may have only had like four stars worth attached to this one molecule of Delta Phos B. In this case, we have eight fluorescent tags attached to this Delta Phos B. And these are just examples. They're not exactly like the number ratios of how it's gonna work, but it gives you an idea of how you can double to triple the stain's intensity by just latching more things onto an expanding tree. There are some downsides for doing this method. And I've used this method plenty of times in the past, uh, but I don't prefer it as much anymore because there is a limit to how much it can amplify. And that limit is not too much under your control. And you can only do it once. So if you had two different targets you want to stain, let's say DFB being one target, and another target called CFOS, and you wanted to do it with different primary antibodies, so an anti-CFOS antibody, an anti-DFB antibody, 
When you try to do the next step with labeling, you can't have multiple secondary antibodies with biotin. The problem is that the streptavidin, these X type shapes, will not be able to discriminate between the donkey anti-rabbit antibody versus the donkey anti-mouse antibody that you might apply later because it only sees biotin and it latches onto wherever biotin is. So you'll have colors mixing in ways that you shouldn't before if you want to try to do multiple color or multiple target label. In comes the other method that I prefer to use nowadays. Uh, it's called tyramide signal amplification. Some uh, literature uh, that's a bit older calls it card. I think that stands for like catalyze amplification reaction deposition or something like that. Uh, so I use this thing called TSA. And so it'll start off being relatively similar. The target will be in the tissue where it says epitopes. That'll be the delta FOS B in this case. That's one. The primary antibody will tag the target as before, rabid anti-DL, DFB, two. The secondary antibody will tag the primary, three, uh, donkey anti-rabbit. The fourth step is what is a little bit different from the previous ones. So rather than a fluorescent tag and rather than having an inert protein like biotin, it has an active protein, an enzyme called horseradish peroxidase attached to the secondary antibody. And it only really needs one active hunk of enzyme attached to this thing because an enzyme will continue to react with stuff as long as, as it is capable of doing so. So we've basically attached uh, a reactive machine onto our target by step four. This isn't visible by itself, but it can change other chemicals around it to make them colored or to make them stick to the target. So then, in the solution, we add a tyramide conjugate. That's where we have uh, tyramine attached to some sort of tag. Uh, Hapton is a technical word for like a label. In this case, we have a fluorescent dye attached to tyramine. It's not active yet, but as it goes through horseradish peroxidase and in the presence of hydrogen and peroxide here, it will become active. And when it becomes active, it will become sticky. So once the active tyramide is floating around a solution, it will go to the nearest tyrosine residues or tyrosine uh, building blocks of nearby proteins. So it will start sticking active tyramide conjugates, AKA the same fluorescent tag pictured here, as much as possible around the vicinity of where the HRP is located. And the key is, that this reaction will keep going as long as HRP is still working, as long as there's enough hydrogen peroxide present, as long as there's more substrate present, the tyramide conjugate stuff, and as long as there are more spots for those conjugates to bind to. So basically you can control the reaction. You can control when it stops, you can control how long it goes for. The longer you let it go for, the more it will continue to amplify the stain. There is a certain limit to that, but the limit is a lot more flexible than the previous step, the labeled streptavidin biotin step. So a little bit more about the TSA, uh, not to be confused with the airline TSA. Certainly a pro is that it amplifies a ton. And that means that you have to do very little adjustment on the images that you take. You can control the amount of amplification like I mentioned before. So in order to figure out what works best for you, when you're trying to run a test, you might try different concentrations of tyramide or different concentrations of the secondary antibody that has HRP attached to it. And then you could try different reaction time durations, like two minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Generally, uh, for my purposes, I've aimed for 20 minutes. Uh, and the dilution I usually use it at is, uh, so if the stock solution is one milligram per milliliter, I dilute it uh, one to 300. But again, your mileage may vary. Additionally, you can select different colors rather easily. There are conjugates that you can buy or can make in the lab that uh, can be blue fluorescing, green fluorescing, red fluorescing, deep red fluorescing, and colors in between these as well. 
uh, giving you a lot of color options where all you have to do is basically just pick the last chemical in the chain that you want to swap in. And one big part of this talk is how you can do multiple rounds of TSA to amplify different targets. So uh, again, I'll show you a little bit more of how that works later, why we might do it. Before I get to that though, there are a few cons to trying to do this heavy duty amplification method. Certainly it's a bit more technically complicated. Uh, it is also a little bit more time sensitive. Whereas with the secondary antibody labeling, so the direct, sorry, the, the labeled secondary antibody labeling, you can wait like two to three hours. For the streptavid and biotin step, you could wait like hour and a half to two hours. For TSA, you really got to control the reaction time and take it out at the end of however many minutes you're trying to do it for. So let's say it's like 20 minutes. You better stop it at 20 minutes instead of leaving it there for like two hours. You can over amplify things too. Um, there are some times when you don't need to amplify markers that are pretty plentiful within tissue. So we certainly don't want to do that. Uh, and this over amplification can also result in too much background tissue staining as well, where it actually starts to obscure your target because there is so much ceramide sinking in on all of the tissue instead of right around where the target is. Additionally, one tricky part about it is that the horseradish peroxidase, because it's an active enzyme, it can be inactivated in certain ways. Uh, certain chemicals can directly do this, even if they're basically coming in as residues that are cross-contaminating across other uh, previous steps. So sodium azide is a very potent inactivator of horseradish peroxidase. Uh, so a concentration of 0.05% in solution will definitely inactivate it. Higher concentration hydrogen peroxide solutions will also inactivate it. I don't know so much if 0.05% will do that, but I would guess that you're going to have problems having uh, HRP working properly if you expose it to 0.1% um, hydrogen peroxide and especially 1% hydrogen peroxide in solution. Another catch is that if you're trying to do multiple rounds of TSA where you label one target with one color and then you do TSA again to label another target a different color, you have to worry about inactivating the HRP of the previous steps. So you have the first round, let's say you have HRP that was indirectly tagged to delta phosphate, and then you react it, it deposits a bunch of green fluorescent tags around DFB. That's all well and good, but then if you're trying to tag CFOS next and you're trying to tag it with uh, another round of HRP, if you have the previous HRP still active, whatever tyramide stuff you put into solution won't be able to tell the difference. There'll be two HRPs. Unlike with the biotin step though, you can inactivate HRP. And I'll show you how to do that in a little bit. One last caveat is that tyramide conjugates can be expensive when we're getting them from vendors. And so uh, they can be like multiple hundreds of dollars for a very small amount. However, earlier research done by Hoffman et al can show you how to synthesize your own in lab with a much smaller upfront cost for a much, much larger amount uh, in result. So the paper information is here. Here's the link, uh, the direct link to the paper. I think it's open access, which is pretty helpful, but it basically gives all the recipes for making these things in-house, so to speak. So what you can end up doing is rather than buying something like fluorescein tyramide and only getting like at best 10 uses for $500, you could make um, hundreds of uses for putting up the upfront cost of maybe $150, maybe $200 or something like that if you just get the base ingredients. So I do recommend that approach of just synthesizing your own tyramide conjugates in-house to keep costs down and to get your supplies up. So finally, how to do the multiple rounds of tyramide signal amplification. There are some starter tips I wanna share before we get into a diagram of how all that works. You can do the primary antibody staining as you normally do. One additional thing you can do is that you can actually combine the primaries together to save time. Most people do the primary step 
uh, overnight where they'll leave it incubating with the tissue for somewhere between like 16 to 24 hours. And so the thing is that uh, imagine doing that for the one primary antibody, and then you have to wait another overnight to do the next primary antibody. You don't necessarily have to wait because as long as these are different species, you can actually mix them together in a sort of solution cocktail together. They won't interfere with each other. They'll, se they'll separate out once they hit the tissue and bind to their respective targets. Now, one caveat about this is that you definitely have to make sure that the primaries are coming from different host animal species. So one can be from rabbit, the other one can be from mouse, um, it can be from goat, it can be from guinea pig, just a lot of random options out there. The key point is that both of these antibodies cannot be from rabbit. So to make this work, you cannot use a rabbit anti-Delta FOS B antibody in addition to a rabbit anti-CFOS antibody. You cannot mix those two together. It has to be different host species. Beyond this primary step though, all the other steps must be sequential and not combined. So you can't combine the secondaries. You can't combine the different tyramide steps. You have to keep those separate and sequential. Anytime that you're uh, ha having a gap between steps, basically between every single step that I'm going to outline here, you're going to be performing what I call rinses with PBS, where it'll be uh, swishing around the tissue in PBS for five minutes. You dump that PBS, you replace it with new PBS, do that another five minutes, and then you dump that PBS replace it with new PBS another five minutes before you move on to the next incubation or staining step. And so this rinsing process is especially important if you use sodium azide uh, as a preservative for some of the solutions. In particular, we definitely wanna wash out any sodium azide residues before we apply anything that has HRP attached. Otherwise the HRP is just not gonna work and we won't understand why. Also, the tyramide colors that you're using to distinguish between the different targets should be pretty different from each other. So the ones that I use, for instance, are fluorescine, which is a green fluorescing tag, and rhodamine, which is a red fluorescing tag. And their color curves do not overlap much, if at all. So that's a good combination. Now, why do multiple rounds of TSA? One can actually determine if two targets co-localize within the same cell. So uh, one can find out in the following example whether delta FOSB overlaps with CFOS staining. In other words, do neurons that have delta FOSB also have CFOS? And that might tell us a little bit more about how the neurons are creating these proteins. If it's different neurons that have the different proteins, then it suggests that different neurons are doing different things when they're ex being exposed to certain stimuli. And so this co-localization aspect is pretty neat when we're trying to get a little bit more information out of what's going on in the tissue. Now, some diagrams. Imagine again that we have delta FOS B over here on the left and then C FOS over here on the right. These are our two distinct targets. We can have a primary antibody cocktail where we have in blue here, the first primary rabbit anti-DFB. And then in pink over here, uh, the second primary antibody, mouse anti-CFOS. And again, these can be combined in the same solution. You'll follow that with a rinse. Then you'll apply the first secondary antibody, donkey anti-rabbit with HRP attached. We'll do a rinse. Then we will apply the tyramide conjugate. In this case, it is fluorescein attached to tyramide. It is not yet active uh, while it's floating around in solution. Then hydrogen peroxide can be added as a catalyst to cause the reaction to take place. And then fluorescein tyramide will be converted into its active form, which will then start sticking onto the tissue. And you would follow this with a rinse just to get rid of the substrate once the reaction is done, let's say at 20 minutes. I mentioned before that you have to inactivate the first round of HRP. Otherwise, if you have more HRP being attached in the second uh, tree being developed over here, then the next, the next tyramide conjugate that you're going to use 
is not going to be able to tell a difference between the HRP that you attached before versus the HRP that you attached more recently. So in order to inactivate HRP from the first step or the first series of steps for the first target, what I do is I incubate the tissue in a 0.05% sodium azide solution, usually in PBS, for 10 minutes. Then I follow that up with another thing that's going to inactivate horseradish peroxidase just to make doubly sure, 1% hydrogen peroxide in solution, again, usually in PBS. And so those applied to HRP will definitely make sure that it is inactive, that it will not work again. So once all that's done, you rinse after these steps, making sure that we get rid of the residues of the azide and the peroxide. We then apply the second secondary antibody. This is donkey anti-mouse. And again, as a refresher, the pink one is mouse anti-CFOS. So we have mouse anti-CFOS and then donkey anti-mouse tags to that, has HRP attached. This HRP is not affected by these ingredients from before because we already washed them out but the previous HRP is dead effectively, so we don't need to worry about that having any influence on the following steps. We then apply a different color uh, tyramide conjugate, so rhodamine tyramide in this case. We apply a bit of hydrogen peroxide, small amounts, much smaller than 1%, in order to catalyze the reaction. It then activates this rhodamine tyramide, which then starts depositing near the target of interest. So by making sure we have that inactivation step, we don't have rhodamine tyramide sticking around this first tree over here, not mingling in with the fluorescein tyramide. It will instead be attaching to the distinct target of CFOS. So the inactivation step is very important for making sure there isn't any accidental cross labeling. Okay, so that's basically how the multiple round TSA process works in practice. Now, I started off this presentation saying, hey, I do free-floating IHC. So let's talk about that. Generally, what this involves is that you'll have tissue sections or slices, if you prefer, that are fixed and they're floating around in solution rather than being attached to a slide. So to define that, fixed tissue is chemically treated, usually with formaldehyde or in some cases, alcohol or acetone in order to make it much more sturdy. So formaldehyde fixed tissue sections or formalin fixed tissue sections are much more sturdy. If you have fresh tissue sections and try to poke at them with a brush while they're floating in solution, they will shred apart and disintegrate. It is really rough. Formaldehyde fixed tissue, especially if it's thick enough, will be able to be picked up by a paintbrush and put onto a slide or swish around free floating in solution for this type of staining. So in free-floating staining, the tissue is not stuck to slides. It is in a well of some sort. And by having it off of a slide, by having it free-floating, the staining solutions that we're applying, the antibody solutions, the tyramide stuff, all that, all of it can penetrate both surfaces, both flat surfaces of free-floating tissue. Compared to if it were on a slide, it would only be able to penetrate the exposed one surface of that section or of that tissue. Being able to penetrate from both directions also allows the stains to go much deeper and much more quickly. So some numbers, uh, generally in free floating tissue, stains can penetrate to a depth of 40 micrometers, depending of course how porous the tissue is. Uh, whereas the same tissue, if it were on a slide, stains might only penetrate 20 micrometers. And certain chemicals can be added in order to increase the penetration depth, such as Triton X100 at a 0.2% concentration. So some pros about free-floating staining. You can uh, drain off, salvage, and reuse certain solutions uh, a certain number of times. So I do this with primary antibodies especially because those are expensive. You can use more sturdy tissue. So this means that you'll slice thicker tissue but it is definitely going to be easier to work with when it is much thicker. Trying to work with, even if it's formaldehyde fixed, trying to work with 20 micrometer thick tissue is kind of difficult. The thinner you go, the more ridiculous it gets where even though it's been chemically treated, 
it's not sturdy enough to hold up against some of the light pressure of a paintbrush. 40 and 50 micrometers, pretty doable. Uh, something like 100 micrometers, really doable, but then you have stain penetration issues. So people usually opt to 40 to 50 micrometers. Certainly by doing free floating method, it's going to be easier to rinse and change solutions for every single staining step. And that last part is definitely expedited by using a netted well plate insert. I'll get back to this in a second. So just to kind of illustrate some of the differences, imagine that we have our tissue, we got a hunk of brain tissue or something, we toss it into a fixation solution of formaldehyde, we then section it with some sort of sectioning device, could be a cryostat, could be a microtome, vibratome, whatever else. We get each of these respective sections, so each of these squares represents one section. In the on-slide method, we have to stick it to a slide, and that slide needs to be to some degree adhesive. So you need special slides that usually cost more in order to keep the tissue from floating up off the slide and moving around or falling off the slide or anything weird like that, where you could just lose data effectively by losing tissue. Then when people apply a stain, uh, they'll usually use a micro pipette to apply a small amount of stain to the tissue here. One downside is that it's gonna be very, very hard to shake the slide, to agitate the uh, solution. And that means that it is going to have a slower job staining and penetrating into the tissue if you're not having it shake around on a shaker. After all that's done, um, any excess is rinsed off and then a cover slip is applied in order to view it under a microscope. Now, if we do the free floating method, we diverge over here where we have the sections not yet attached to a slide. Instead, we have the tissue floating around in this well, and it is going to be tagged with a primary antibody, a secondary antibody, and so on and so forth. Then once the tissue is fully stained, you can mount it on a not adhesive slide, so something that is a lower cost regular glass microscopy slide, and then once it's been lightly dried or completely dried, you can cover slip it with a cover slipping medium uh, and go from there. A little bit more about how we can do free floating staining. I use netted inserts. So you could just have tissue hanging around in a well plate, but then you have to basically pick up the tissue with forceps or with a paper clip, like a hanger, lift it out of a well, move it to the next well. Now imagine doing that ad nauseum with, with hundreds of sections. It's completely unmanageable. It just takes forever. So uh, that has led to science supply companies producing sort of netted inserts, uh, we can call them. One name for it is like netted well plate, netted insert. There's a lot of different names for it. So they're a little bit hard to search online. Uh, but if you look up uh, netted staining insert or staining insert, uh, by itself, tissue staining insert will probably give you a result looking something like this. We've got a bunch of different devices here, but basically they're these thimble looking things that have a porous net on the bottom. And it works like a sieve where it catches the tissue in that net, but the solution can fall through. So then whatever receptacle contain the solution it has a solution still sitting in there. You lift the net out, it has the tissue in the net. You replace the solution that's in the well uh, and then you reinsert the net and the tissue will go back to floating. One downside of this is that you're still doing things well by well. So you'll have to do well one, replace solution, reinsert the netted insert. Well two, pull out, replace solution, uh, reinsert the insert. That's still pretty tedious. So the approach I prefer is by having the all of the netted well inserts attached together and lifting out of a collective solution basin. So rather than having the solution separated by wells, if they're all receiving the same treatment, there's no point in having them separated out uh, as far as the solution is. You only need to separate them out into the actual inserts. So instead of having six of these thimble things being put into a six well plate, you can have six slots of a netted insert that you number accordingly by maybe 
putting some Sharpie here, 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 one, two, three, four, to keep track of which well is which. And it all gets stuck into the same basin. So this way, you can lift all the sections out simultaneously. So there isn't going to be any time lag. Uh, they're going to basically have the solution replaced immediately and simultaneously, very easily. You just pour it out. You pour some new solution in. It doesn't require precise pipetting, really, in order to do that, because you'll have pre-measured amounts that are able to fit into this basin figured out. So that works out pretty well. The specific product that this is showing is called Preppies from Ted Pella. You might see some other examples elsewhere. Thing is that this very specific product, pretty pricey. I think it's like 130 bucks uh, for the uh, for one insert plus its uh, basin. Well, it has some replacement basins, but still, that's that's a lot for just this one case. So if you want to stain tons and tons of tissue, you'd have to get multiple in that as quickly. However, I've been looking into alternatives where we can design and 3D print equivalents to this, maybe slightly larger ones, ones with more holes, uh, all sorts of options, really. So that can become a low cost alternative that I'm still trying to uh, sort out. All that said, though, this allows you to stain sections in a free floating way in order to basically have them go through the solutions as quickly as possible and without any sort of confusion about uh, which thing went to which well. So that wraps up all the background I wanted to talk about. And I know that's quite a lot, but I think now it's important to see exactly how the free floating staining works in action and how I apply the rinses and the tyramide conjugate steps and all that sort of stuff. So basically the following video examples will show you the setup I showed before where I tried to use multiple rounds of TSA to stain first Delta Fos B, then C Fos, and then at the end, including a counter stain, DAPI, which stains all cell nuclei in blue in order to get a good sort of background image of the whole section of tissue and figure out where I am in the brain.